Discovery Passes and Toddler Tuesdays. Big things are happening at the Children's Museum of South Carolina. Pay them a visit on this morning's Carolina People, coming up next. Good morning. Welcome to Carolina People. This morning we're at the Myrtle Beach Herald. We're focused on the Children's Museum of South Carolina and we're visiting with their executive director, Pam Ross. Good morning, Good morning Pam. Good morning to you. Thanks so much for coming in. Well, I'm glad you asked us to be here. It's so exciting to think about uh, so much going on at the Children's Museum now and you all schedules during the day and hearing mm -hmm. a little more about Toddler Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, I guess you all, this has been going on a long time now. Toddler Tuesday is one of our premier programs that we started several years ago. Mm -hmm. And it is, uh, I was thinking about that, what time does that kick off? Are there multiple sessions of that? Well, there are. We started off with one session every two weeks, and at the request of parents, uh, we went to two sessions on Tuesdays, and we offer it each week now. Mm -hmm. Every week. Every week. Okay. And y'all's, uh, what are y'all's hours during the day, Pam? Um, during the school year, we're open Tuesday through Saturday, 10 to 4. And during the summer, we're open Monday through Saturday, 10 to 4. Okay. Sure. I'm sure y'all get huge crowds in the summertime. Yeah. We do, but we, ha we have lots of uh, visitors to the museum year round. Not mm -hmm. just the summer facility. Of course, our attendance rate's higher then because of the influx of tourists in the area. But we have a, a a growing base of patrons locally as well. Mm -hmm. Real quick about yourself, Pam, are you originally from the area? I am, native Horry County person. Is that right? Yeah. Born and bred. Yeah, not many of us left. <laughs> no, that's right, that's right. And do you, have you stayed in the county virtually your entire life or did yeah. you leave for a while? Mm -hmm. I've, I've stayed here, I grew up here, I attended Coastal Carolina University, went to Francis Marion University, um, came back to Coastal, and I've been in the county since. That is fascinating. Mm -hmm. You know, so oftentimes folks will leave and then they're somehow pulled back. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and of course that stint there at Francis Marion was uh, a little bit of a trip, but not too far. That's great. No, it wasn't bad. Had you always known you wanted to stay here in the county? Pretty much so. I, I think I'm more open now to other places than I was when I was young. Uh, it was not as it was not as a popular thing to do necessarily when I was younger and going into college mm -hmm. as it is now to move away from home for so far. Right. Which you, is attributed to the growth of coastal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Coastal has just yeah. had a tremendous growth in the area. Uh -huh. And of course the influx of folks who, as as you say, who come down to coastal but stay in this area, who really try to claim Horry County as home. And then, too, we've got a young group who are now leaving to go to, away to school, but they're coming back to the area. Yeah, and you can tell that in your job markets when people call and want to know if you've got positions open, that type mm -hmm, of thing. Mm -hmm. Do you still have family in the area, Pam? Oh, yes, I do. Mm -hmm. My, my uh, mother lives here in the area, always has, right. and my sister. Mm -hmm. And your sister. That's mm -hmm. great. Well, you know, it's so fascinating, as you see. And if they got involved with the museum at all, or do they come visit you over there? Or? My mother used to volunteer some at the museum, uh, and uh, my sister has three kids of her own. So when they come, they're there to enjoy the museum. Oh, yeah, yeah. that's right. No volunteering for her when they're there. I'm sure she feels like she's volunteering <laughs> yeah. watching them. She feels like she's a staff member when she's got three kids with her. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you all have a lot of volunteers, Pam? We do have some volunteers. Uh, we'd like to grow our volunteer base. Uh, right now we have a lot of volunteers that consist of students mm -hmm. that are middle school, high school age. Uh, we use volunteers from the pre-trial intervention program. Mm -hmm. And we also have uh, a growing number of retired citizens that are moving to the area. And this year it's, it's been unusual for us in that we've had a number of Snowbirds, they're coming to the area during the winter and they're volunteering as a husband and wife team. And mm -hmm. they're coming to volunteer together at the same time, as opposed to just one of them coming to volunteer. And that's, that's been a little bit different for us and it's been great. We've oh, had a yeah. great experience with it. What are some of the things that volunteers are asked to do when they come in? And would they come in for the full day? Would they come in for a week? I mean, are, is, are there multiple opportunities? What are some of the things they, uh, they'd be able to do? 
Well, we try to vary it, and it depends on what we need at the time, actually. Mm -hmm. um, if we've got large field trips coming in, then our coordinator will call the volunteers and see who can come in and help. And sometimes they just come for those large field trips. Mm -hmm. Or they may just come stay three or four hours and leave, or they may come that afternoon. Um, if it's a pretrial intervention volunteer, then mm -hmm. they have a certain number of hours that are required for volunteering. And so we catalog those for them so that we can document their experience. And of course, our students, primarily volunteer on Saturdays mm -hmm. because they don't get out of school until we're closed, right. essentially. Mm -hmm. And so Saturday is about the best time for them to volunteer. So it fluctuates. And sometimes of the year we have a lot more volunteers than we do at other times. Mm -hmm. um, so we try to work with the volunteer base that we've got. And we'd like to grow that volunteer base. Sure. But as a small facility, uh, we can only handle so many volunteers. But we're really excited about this, uh, what appears to be um, husband and wife couple volunteering. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's something different for us. We we haven't had that until last couple of months. Whether it's snowbirds or locals, mm -hmm. absolutely. If folks it's who can really do it year great. round, or folks mm -hmm. could could just do it on a seasonal basis. Mm -hmm. Where where are y'all located, Pam? For viewers who in, in the PD or southeastern North Carolina who may not have been down, or even for local viewers who may not have, have visited the museum. We were located at 2501 North Kings Highway, uh, so that everyone knows where that is. Right. We're right across the street from the Myrtle Beach Convention Center. Okay. And in the back parking uh, area of the what used to be the Marvel Square Mall. Right. Sure. Y'all. Office Depot. Y'all are next door to Office Depot. We're next door to Office Depot, That's and it's a, a good thing because we're always <laughs> we always yeah. need materials. Absolutely. From Office Depot. That may be a place to tap some volunteers. <laughs> Hit them up for. They've uh, been very gracious and they're very helpful to us. I'm as sure. Well. Yeah. yeah, they were recently voted Office Supply Store of the Year. I can. I probably helped Bill that name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they've been really good. A good neighbor to have in Absolutely. the business community. Absolutely. The history of the museum, Pam, has it been around a good a good while, or it's relatively new to the area? Well, actually, the museum opened back in 1994 mm -hmm. in a small retail space, about 1,200 square feet in Myrtle Square Mall. Mm -hmm. And we've been open since then. We've gone through several phases of growth during that time, acquired a larger space in the space we are now, mm -hmm. and then we required part of a restaurant space that was attached to the space we're in. Mm -hmm. um, I keep telling the folks at Office Depot to watch out. I'm, I may yeah, end up with That's these. right. That's right. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, we've about, we have about 7,900 square feet right now. Is that right? But we're still considered a very small museum at 7,900 square feet. I think I read and reading a little about the museum that y'all were the first children's museum of its kind in South Carolina, if not one of the first in the Southeast. Well, we were, weren't the first in the Southeast, but we were the first one in the state of South Carolina. Uh -huh. And in 1994, when we opened, there, there was no other children's museums. And children's museums in the mid to late 80s, early 90s, mm -hmm. really had a tremendous growth spurt natural, uh, nationally. Mm -hmm. And when we opened, we were one of three states that did not have a children's museum, mm -hmm. which is what led a lot of our community leaders and the business people that support the museum to open the children's museum mm -hmm. to begin with. Sure, of course, with so many of the folks from uh, the southeast visiting Myrtle Beach mm -hmm. and having a chance to experience a children's museum possibly for the first time, particularly folks throughout the Palmetto State. Mm -hmm. Were there a lot of museums y'all uh, traveled around to, or, and maybe talk a little about the inception of the museum? When, who who all came together to, to form the museum back in '94? Well, there was um, uh, Kathy Levan had moved to this area, and she had moved from an area that had a prominent children's museum, mm -hmm. and our board members, being business people traveled and when they would go to cities for travel for business their families would accompany them and they would go to children's museums really and um that planted a seed for the type of need that we would have here because they came back and we didn't have anything like True. that and so in 94 that group came together and they opened the children's museum not knowing what would happen right. so that's why they went with a small space and with 1200 square feet sure. to kind of see if it would grow over time and how receptive the community would be to a children's museum actually oh absolutely so they raised some funds so that they mm -hmm. could funnel them into the the space there the 1200 square feet mm -hmm. then you're almost five or six times that size and moving into the you said 7900 square feet there yeah we've got 7900 square feet there next door to office depot and of course the plans now to pop to 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 move into a much larger space in a couple of years within we a few have, years mm -hmm. out at uh, right adjacent to Broadway of the Beach mm -hmm. or there at Broadway of the Beach yeah. in the corner of 29th and Grissom Parkway mm -hmm. tremendous location 
What about when you think through uh, back to those early early times and they planned out the key things that they really had to have to make a children's museum tick? What were, I mean, of course, you've been you've been at the museum how long, Pam? Um, I've been affiliated with the museum since 1996, and okay. at one level or another. Wow! So almost since its inception. But when you when, in talking to those folks back to '94, some of the things they felt they really had to have to make sure the children's museum would not only be around but would continue to grow. Well, our board of directors have invested a lot of resources into our educational programs right. and the development of those programs. And that is one of the things that I think has caused the museum to be able to grow and to sustain itself. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that the board did was they were patient mm -hmm. and that they didn't rush out. Um, those board members traveled all over the country. Mm. I have literally boxes of pictures mm -hmm. that they took. They took of exhibits. They looked, they went and met with other directors. They talked to other board members. Uh, there were some of those board members that were attending museum conferences before the museum even opened. Wow. So I attribute a lot of its success, even though we're small right now, mm -hmm. to the fact that they have been patient over time, and that patience has allowed them to develop a product that has, has worked very well for us in the community mm -hmm. and, and is in the state as far as that goes. Absolutely, particularly being a pioneer in the state, which surely mm -hmm. set the stage. Where are some other children's museums located now statewide? Um, Adventures in Columbia. Right. It's been open about a year, and the Low Country Children's Museum is in Charleston. Is that right? So there are only three in the state, but again, Myrtle right Beach now. was the pioneer. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. You know, when you think about, of course, those much larger cities of much larger permanent populations mm -hmm. that Myrtle would lead the pack. I wonder about in, in North Carolina, if there are many children's museums up there. There are several in North Carolina. Really? Mm -hmm. You know, you think of it, and of course, that state's almost twice the size population-wise mm -hmm. of, of South Carolina, so you'd, you'd imagine. Well, and North Carolina has a stronger base of just historical museums and science mm -hmm. museums that complement children's museums as well than mm -hmm. the state of South Carolina. So that would be common where a children's museum would be associated with another museum in a town? Not necessarily. Um, they don't, a lot of times they're not. But when you have a population base that is used to attending right, museums, right. you have a mindset for what museums have that they can offer. And that encourages attendance. Mm -hmm. Whereas before, if, if there weren't uh, such facilities, you wouldn't have a patronage that was used to attending those kinds of right. things. And so it's a little bit harder. And it was a learning experience. It's been a learning experience for the locals here in Myrtle Beach mm -hmm. because they hear Children's Museum of South Carolina and they think Smithsonian, behind glass, mm -hmm. don't touch. Right. And so it's been an educational process for our locals as sure. well to get them to, oh, I didn't know it was like this, you know, right. hands-on and interactive. Hands -on, absolutely. Yeah, because that is our premise, to be hands-on and make sure everything is interactive and engaging for both the adult and the child. Speaking of that, Pam, let's, let's give the viewers a sense, particularly viewers who haven't visited or others that haven't been there in quite a while. Mm -hmm. Could you give a little bit of a virtual tour if someone was coming in, parked in the parking lot there in y'all's big office <laughs> depot parking lot, what they're going to see when they come in, maybe as if you were visiting for the first time? Well, when they walk into the doors, uh, we have a lobby entryway that's also filled with exhibits. Mm -hmm. uh, we've just added a huge light bright that actually uses uh, plastic water bottles really? and colored water oh, to, wow. to dispense color particles. It's really neat. We just uh, we saw one at a museum conference this past summer, and uh, we uh, had one built. Sure. Uh, we have about 500 feet of tubing in the ceiling wound around colored lights with um, megaphones at the end so you can time how long it takes your voice to leave from the time you spoke to the time you hear it in your ear. No. And uh, we have a giant kaleidoscope in the outside, mm -hmm. a lobby away so that you can mix colors and, and objects. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a gravity well for uh, most of our patrons race nickels, dimes, quarters, and pennies mm -hmm. down mm -hmm. the gravity well. And then when they walk in, uh, we have a small gift shop area, mm -hmm. and then they enter into the museum, and we have a, uh, it's electric exhibit that mm -hmm. focuses on power production uh, that the engineer that Santee Cooper built for us. It's right. an old World War II generator that you sit on, you pedal it by hand, and by opening and closing the circuits, you light up the city of Myrtle Beach that they've oh, yeah. constructed a small little city How underneath exciting. glass. Yeah. And then we have a circuitry table where they build circuits and radios and horns and things like that. Right. Um, we have a magic school bus where students or kids can enjoy a little field trip with Miss Frizzle, which is a, a great reading program oh, for yeah. them. 
elementary I've literacy. Seen that. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have a, a, a little small puppet theater, and we have a, a little, it's called Animal Tales. It's a dress-up area where they can put animal masks on and animal tails on in a little barn. That's a great idea. So they can idea. enjoy that. Mm -hmm. um, we have a Discovery Classroom, and our Discovery Classroom is multifunctional in that we can have groups there. We can have classes in there. Right. We do use it as a birthday party room on weekends. Oh, yeah, I know. But the room itself is designed to engage people into looking into the ecosystems and wetlands mm -hmm. and indigenous plants to our area. We do some wildlife recovery with Ark Animal Hospital. Mm -hmm. We've got a couple of bunnies. We've got some uh, dagoos, which are Chilean squirrels right now, mm. and some birds uh, that we take care of. And so we've got a... Um, a section that has tree frogs and rain frogs and lizards in it and you really? know, different things and real kids things. love that yeah, yeah real yeah. things yeah real things kids love that and then when you leave that area you enter the main exhibit area and there's a toddler area that's right. designed for children four and under large oversized soft play tactile um, focuses on dexterity uh, where they may have a, a vest that's on the wall so they can practice zipping mm -hmm. um, uh, Lacing shoestrings, oh, buttoning, yeah. you know, locks and things of that nature. There's a storyboard in there, uh, magnetic storyboard as well as a felt storyboard, uh, magnetic table just high enough for little guys that you know right. are maybe 18 to two years old. So two years, yeah. Yeah, and um, large oversized building blocks, that type mm -hmm. of thing mm -hmm. for that area. Uh, so it kind of separates them from the larger kids, but you had a mother or father that has kids of two ages. Mm -hmm. The museum's still small enough they can see both of them. Yes, and in be that there large open small area, time. absolutely. And then we have um, our USS Kids Afloat, which actually is a large boat, and the kids get on it, and we, we have them suit up in a life vest. One of the purposes of having it is to teach kids boating safety, that mm. they, if they're on water, they need to have a life jacket on. Mm -hmm. And then also some terminology, you know, what starboard, you know, th that type of thing with the boat. But when they get on the boat, the center of the boat actually is a gigantic water bed. Mm. And it has a raft on it. So once they're suited up in their life vest, they can get into the raft, and the raft moves because it's a water bed. Yes. So they get the motion of the water without the water. Wow. And we've been very fortunate. It's only burst one time. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Water beds hold a lot of water. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So they can get in the wheelhouse of the boat and pretend like they're, they're steering the boat. Children's museums are built on the premise that kids go in and they role play and they yeah. actively engage in that type of learning. Mm -hmm. you, know, you and I get up each morning and we go to work. Well, a child's play is their work. Mm -hmm. And so they go to places like the Children's Museum to work so that they can play and learn. Mm. And uh, we have a South Carolina fossil dig exhibit mm -hmm. where the uh, fossils are embedded in concrete under sand. And they use paintbrushes to excavate. And all of those fossils were found along the coast of South Carolina. Um, there's this big, uh, huge saltwater tank. Uh, we have a freshwater tank with some catfish in it, some uh, a shell identification exhibit. We also have a bubble area where they can make bubbles. You know, not everybody can say they stood inside of a That's bubble. right. I think you've been oh, inside yeah. that bubble break. I have break. a number of times, yeah. <laughs> sure My daughter's have. pulled me in there. Yeah, I'm sure like staying she has. in there. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody, young and, and old, it doesn't matter. Everybody likes to play with bubbles right. and learn. And so we have the bubble area, and we have a uh, express yourself area, which is a large craft make and take area where we have different prototypes in there, and we keep materials out but they're free to make whatever they would like to make oh, yeah. uh, and the mothers really love this because the glitter and glue stay with us they don't have to yes, clean up that's right they do and we've just renovated the express yourself art area so it looks totally new so if you haven't been there in the last two weeks it's totally new. oh exhibit. great yeah i have yeah, it's totally new and um we're in the process of making some changes there even though we're going to build a new facility we want to keep things fresh mm -hmm. we have a, a beetle volkswagen Mm -hmm. that we use where the kids can get in and actually steer the Volkswagen mm -hmm. to talk about child safety. They don't realize that when they're on a bike or they're walking that people really can't see them over the steering wheel. Mm -hmm. And so we have that. We have a pizza truck. Yes. And they can, you know, your daughters use the pizza oh, truck. Oh, yeah, very um, We have a uh, pizza oven in the back where they can put a pizza in and make it. And, it. and that focuses on fractions. You know, what's a half, a third, a fourth, that type of thing, uh -huh. a whole pizza. Um, we have an ATM machine that uses Children's Museum ATM cards right. yes. and Children's Museum money. And uh, we have a medical emergency room area 
where they can role play being the receptionist. They can be a doctor. There's a dental chair. There's an x-ray machine. Uh, we mm -hmm. have all of that there. But one of the newest things we got at the museum right now is we are hosting our third in a series of three traveling exhibits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This one came from the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry, and it's called Make It Move. And it mm. focuses on the world of motion mm -hmm. and the mechanics of motion and what makes things move. I'm, young and old are always curious. Sure, I bet you know, everyone wants to uh, If you change your, uh, the fulcrum and you're using levers and pulleys, you know, uh, one of the exhibits has the ball. We all see it at a circus where you see someone go up and they're trying to hit the bell to knock the ball up to the top. Right. Well, one of the exhibits is that where they actually have to do that, but they learn to do it by adjusting the fulcrum underneath the lever so that it's easy to make it go to the top the first time they try. Uh -huh. Yeah. And so it's a great exhibit, and it will be with us until May the 7th. And there's no additional charge to the museum. Once you pay right. general admission, you can go in and you can enjoy that exhibit. And it has lots of interactive components to it. There's an excavator mm -hmm. that children can get on. And there's also um, a crane. We've had several moms saying, you know, if you could sell those cranes and excavators, you could make a million dollars a week. <laughs> I told my husband, I says, you need to learn to make those because yeah, right. there could be a market there Absolutely. for those. Because the little boys get on them and they don't want to get oh, on yeah, them. Sure they they of course, they're square foam rocks, right. but they look like the real thing and they get in an excavator and they just are, they put, they move them all over the place. Oh, and then yeah, the crane, yeah. they can pick up stuff and move it. And there's all kinds of things, different components. And you, it, it's really difficult for kids to make a mess that there that uh, I mean mess on themselves I'm thinking of throughout the throughout the entire museum there's really not nor are there really any uh, any potentially any danger areas I mean obviously there's always volunteers around there's always uh, uh, off, almost always parents around or otherwise and, staff members. and staff members around so it's a tremendous and of course it's uh, difficult for me to tell the, the difference between staff and volunteers because there's always folks around which mm -hmm. is a great thing um, the one thing that differentiates so that the patron knows is our volunteers all have volunteer tags okay. and our staff members all have picture ID tags uh -huh. uh, for security purposes sure sure um, and we try to make sure that no child comes back through the front entrance way without an adult because right. while well, there is just basically one way in and out other than the fire safety doors, mm -hmm. um, sometimes kids will wonder if there's more than one child with a parent. And so we try to make sure nobody gets past that front desk mm -hmm. without doing that. But, you know, you brought up the safety issue. We, we take it, all the precautions we can to keep it safe and make oh, yeah. sure it's a safe environment for everybody. Oh, yeah. But kids can find the darndest things to get oh, hurt on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You'd be surprised sometimes. That's right. I'm sure. But we've been very fortunate. We've been very fortunate. And uh, we, a lot of that's the fact that as I walk by or the program director walks by, okay. Is that going to be there? Yeah, you're no. trained to look for problems. <laughs> yeah. yeah I told somebody that. I said, I get that's what I get paid to do is yeah. to, to, to uh, literally play devil's advocate because Absolutely. if not, somebody will get hurt. So we, mm -hmm. we take every precaution we can. And, and things do require a lot of maintenance. You know, what looks to be totally functional when you've got hundreds of kids on it through it and oh, moving yeah. it and oh, yeah. separating its parts, it takes some wear and tear. Absolutely. And I've always seen either staff or volunteers making sure, you know, that there's a desire to stand up and jump up and down on the waterbed, for instance. And it's a real encouragement to go ahead and sit down. You can sit on that, put on the life preserver, mm -hmm. but it's not a, something to be jumped up and down on. I'm sure they could break more often. Than well, they, they, could, they could hurt themselves, right. which is the worst case scenario. Sure. Uh, as far as we're concerned, the water bed would bust and we wouldn't right. be inundated with water and then mm -hmm. they might really need those. Right. <laughs> That's right. But uh, they hold a tremendous amount of water. But uh, we take every precaution that we can. And it is a full time job. And we straighten up, sure. but it's a constant straighten up. I try to remind staff that, you know, you can only do so much. Mm -hmm. And when kids come in, they're going to move stuff. So don't get uh, your feelings get hurt. Out. Because, yeah. Yeah, yeah, don't get stressed out because it's going to happen. So. That's absolutely. We just got a couple of minutes, Pam. If, if you wanted to learn more about the museum or, again, to check on y'all's hours, that's Tuesday through Saturday. Mm -hmm. Was that 9 to 4? Uh, 10 to 4. 10 to 4, okay. Until June 15th, and then we're open Monday through Saturday. Okay, 10 okay. To 4. 
Share with a, a little bit about uh, membership, uh, the cost there, and again, the best phone number for someone to call. Okay. Our memberships, uh, we have different types of passports. Uh, the basic level passport is a discovery passport, and, and it's $70, and it allows up to five people per year to enter the museum as often as they like. Right. And um, we have a reciprocal passport. The reciprocal passport is something that we have with the Association of Children's Museums nationwide. Right. And there's a group of museums that if you purchase the reciprocal typical membership you get into all the other museums free of charge. Right. So we have that. We have birthday parties that are available. If you like to book a birthday party at the museum, it's oh, a great yeah. place. And, and it's, it's a great party for the money at the Children's Museum. And the number at the museum is 946-9469. Right. And we also have a website uh, that we have that has the information on it, and that is www.cmsckids.org. That's great. Pam, lastly, what's the most important thing that a viewer could do to be involved and to continue to help the museum grow? At the current facility, to volunteer and to give support to the current facility to keep it open. It's a large task when you're in the capital campaign to raise funds for a new building mm -hmm. to keep a current facility open. Mm -hmm. And the board made a choice to do that a long time ago so that we didn't lose our place in the public eye. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would help a tremendous amount. And for the capital campaign, if someone watching or knows someone watching that would like to contribute or would mm -hmm. like to get involved with the capital campaign process, we are always welcome to that and would welcome anybody to help us with that. Fantastic. Pam, thanks so much for being Thank with us this morning. Thank you for having us. Look forward to seeing you and your daughter at the museum. We'll be there. Thanks. Absolutely. Stay tuned to more Carolina People with Pam Ross coming up next. Think about that, born and bred in the same county, staying here for this long, so, such a commitment to think as executive director for now, two and a half years of the pioneer Children's Museum in the state of South Carolina. You've got cities like Columbia and Charleston following in the footsteps of Myrtle Beach. Folks travel here from all over the world. They come in and visit our Children's Museum. They go back to their homes and say, we want to start one in our town. It happened to the board members back in 94. They came back and s said Myrtle Square Mall is going to be our first home. Then we're going to jump into the location next office depot, and next place you'll see them in a couple of years. Within a couple of years, it'll be on the corner of 29th Avenue and Bob Grissom Parkway. It's that opportunity to go in there as an adult or a child, as an adult to remember your childhood, to experience so many aspects you go in there now and you see adults just thrilled by the activities and they're kind of living it through with their kids. Give them a call, 843-946-9469, whether it's an opportunity to volunteer, to check out hours, or go online at cmscikids.org.